It's been almost a year since Marvel's Midnight Suns by Firaxis Games was released, but despite reviewing well and having the Marvel property attached to it, the game was unable to catch a foothold in the market, and is considered a financial flop, at least according to Take-Two CEO Strash Zelnick in an interview with Bloomberg. Being released in December 2022, Midnight Suns was all too easily overlooked because it was buried by all the big holiday season games coming out at the same time. Which surprised me, even though I waited this long to play it myself. As soon as I knew what it was, I knew I would love it. Since it's a tactical turn-based RPG with some of Marvel's most popular superheroes, made by one of the most successful strategy game developers of all time, I assumed the game would do well enough to break even. The way I saw it, Midnight Suns was Firaxis' chance to step a little more into the mainstream. Take something niche like a turn-based isometric strategy game XCOM specifically, and combine it with the mainstream accessibility of Marvel. What they came up with is a card-based RPG with social life and exploration elements mixed into it. My name's PoopBro420, and I'm here to explain to you why I think Marvel's Midnight Suns is still worth your time, even if you're suffering from superhero fatigue like I am. When I first started the game, I was worried that the heroes in Midnight Suns would be cheap knockoffs of the heroes from the movies. Like when I saw Iron Man, I thought, dude, this guy is just doing a Robert Downey Jr. impression. Wait, you seriously don't know who I am? Hey pal, I don't think you understand. Things are changing. Two plus two no longer equals four. Up is sometimes down, and strange here is actually starting to make sense. Firaxis wants to be clear that Midnight Suns is based off the comic books, not the movies. The title itself, Midnight Suns, refers to a comic strip that ran in the 90s. The first one was a Ghost Rider comic called Rise of the Midnight Suns from 1992. In it, two Ghost Riders, Blade and Morbius, join forces against the evil demon Lilith. No, not that one. She's a demon lady that uses an evil book called the Darkhold to take over the world. That is Darkhold, not Darkhole. Dark Hold. So anyway, Lilith uses her dark hole to take over the world, or so she tries. From 1992 to 1996, anytime these heroes crossed over into each other's comics, that comic's cover would reflect this by changing its cover title to Midnight Suns. Not too different from an Avengers comic. I think a big reason the title Midnight Suns was chosen is that Firaxis wanted fans to know that the people making this game are comic book fans first and you can expect a fresh look at some of your favorite comic book heroes and not another watered-down video game version of the MCU heroes. I I'm sorry, Square Enix. Our story begins with Lilith being summoned by evil forces. She was sealed away hundreds of years ago, but she's back now, and that means she needs to be stopped. We're shown a scene in the desert with Doctor Strange and his best friend Iron Man trying to recruit Johnny Blaze, the old Ghost Rider, to help them defeat Lilith. Johnny Blaze rejects the hero's offer and drives away. After a tutorial fight, Doctor Strange gets a call from Bruce Banner informing him that the Sanctum Santorum is under attack by demons. Doctor Strange and Iron Man unite with Captain Marvel and Wanda Maximoff at the scene to fight Lilith off, but they fail. The group realizes early on that right now, they are no match for Lilith and need all the help they can get. Doctor Strange tells Iron Man that they have no choice but to summon the Hunter, the hero who defeated Lilith hundreds of years ago in the past and gave their life doing it. Hey, that's you! A brand new superhero created just for this very occasion, which you will be building in a simple create a character menu not too long from now. The gang calls up someone called the Caretaker, who's in charge of the Midnight Suns, a secret organization that only exists to fight Lilith. Their members include heroes I had heard of before, like Blade and the new Ghost Rider, Robbie Reyes, and heroes I'd never heard of, like Magic from the X-Men, and Goddess Queen, Nico Minaru. Everyone meets up at a big mausoleum grave located near a secret abbey in Salem, Massachusetts. After some quippy dialogue, they begin performing a creepy occult ritual. Just like that, the hunter is back from the dead. Since he's from hundreds of years ago, the hunter's personality is based on your typical Dungeons and Dragons knight. 
Anytime he talks about himself or his past, it usually involves wizards, giant snakes, potions, that kind of thing. He explains to the Midnight Suns that he can sense things others cannot, like people's power. Of course. Caretaker has reformed the Midnight Suns. Whoa. How did you... Your power. I can feel it. I always do. From that point on, the Midnight Suns see the Hunter as their natural leader. But right off the bat, it was clear to me that this game's dialogue is a little corny. But I was still chuckling at many jokes that landed as they were intended to. You now have control of the Hunter and can walk around the giant abbey freely. It's going to serve as your hub world for the entire game. It's a little embarrassing to admit, but a big reason I think I like this game is because of how customizable the Abbey is itself, but uh, more on that later. As Nico and your new friends show you around the Abbey, more of the gameplay loop is revealed. Every day is split into three parts, the morning, the day, and the evening. You wake up and talk to your superhero friends first. They also live in this Abbey with you, Anyone who has joined your group, the Midnight Suns, must live with you in the Abbey. I don't care if you're the friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. New York is just going to have to figure it out until I'm done sending you on missions with me. No exceptions. How else am I supposed to level up my friendship level with all my favorite Marvel heroes? That's right. Just like those creepy Persona games, Midnight Suns has a social element to it, where anything you say can make your fellow Midnight Suns like you a little more or a little less. Now you could just go through this game by answering all the questions however you want and pretend that you're actually the hunter to maybe immerse yourself into the narrative. I think that's what was intended anyway, but it would really benefit you way more to just kiss everyone's ass as much as possible. Whenever your friendship level goes up with someone, you'll unlock passive skills for that character and better cards for them to use in combat. There are also no actual choices in the game whatsoever, so there are zero consequences to just telling the hero you're talking to whatever they want to hear. Despite the game having a light and dark balance to uh, everything you say, all that affects is your moves in combat. You'll also spend some of your morning upgrading your hub world, upgrading your moves, and for lack of a better term, opening new card packs. That's right, card packs. This is a card game after all. All the heroes have unique card decks that you will be upgrading and adding new cards to throughout the game. The more you use characters and level them up, the better unique attacks you'll get for them in the form of cards. When you first look at combat in Midnight Suns, you'll see some similarities between this game and XCOM. But you're not playing as disposable soldiers who spend most of their time behind cover. These are iconic superheroes. That means combat is big and cinematic. Another redraw. Baby girl, do it. Here we go. Oh, man. My PS5's getting warm. My favorite attacks are the ones that throw your enemies at other enemies, environmental hazards, or even your own party members who will do extra damage. Despite the game eventually having a roster of over 13 different superheroes to choose from, none of them ever felt like reskins of each other. Every character has unique strengths and weaknesses, and I felt like I could kick ass with literally any party of three. For example, Iron Man is really good at supporting other heroes in his party with attack buffs and extra armor. Nico's great at building heroism, the currency used to play more powerful cards. Wow, Blade can clear a room quickly and look damn cool doing it. You don't have to show off for me, Blade. There are times where you'll get a little lucky and completely dominate an encounter. I think Joe Weinhofer, who was a designer for the game, said it best in an interview with D'Angelo Epps for Digital Trends. Yeah, people are going to find some broken shit where we're just like, oh my god. But that's kind of the fun. That's the joy of games like this. And it's also made even better by the fact that at every turn, you can't exactly predict what abilities are there thanks to the card system. So it's cool to break the game every once in a while to where it's like when everything lines up just right. The level of customization is remarkable too. As you continue through the game, you can add modifiers to any card you use in combat. 
meaning there's no real cap on how good your characters can get. If you wanted it to, this gameplay loop can last for hundreds of hours and your characters would eventually become otherworldly bringers of death. This combat is satisfying and in my opinion, the best part of the Midnight Suns package. Before you go into combat, you'll need to select a mission for the day. You'll get a choice between a mission that continues the story or one of four optional missions where you'll choose what kind of reward currency you want to go for. There's a lot of different mission types like defend this thing, destroy this person and or creature, and if you're feeling extra frisky, destroy this car before it gets away. While you very well could just do all the story missions, I fell into a satisfying loop where I was doing as many optional missions as I could while leveling up my characters as much as possible and getting stronger cards for everyone in the process. Once you finish your mission, it's time for what hardcore gamers who like deep games refer to as quiet time. All the superheroes get into their jammies and start doing calming activities to unwind for the evening. Activities that you can participate in. Most of these sound boring on paper because they are, but they usually don't take longer than 60 seconds and are there to serve as a dialogue prompt to possibly maximize your friendship growth level with whoever you're talking to. You'll also get opportunities to join social clubs as if the Abbey is a high school. Blade gets the idea to start a book club with Captain America and Captain Marvel. So every so often, you get to talk about how a certain book made you feel with these characters. Like I said before, it's in your best interest to do this stuff because of the major benefits you get for combat. Especially book club because you get XP for like 4 people every time you do it. Now as much as I love this game, I have not been looking forward to talking about this, but it would be dishonest of me not to address it. The optional content in Midnight Suns is boring as shit. Like, dude, book club? Really? You've got Blade and all these superhero friends hanging out, and the best thing you can come up with for your optional content is to go the high school JRPG route? Trust me, the game is still worth your time, but they'll have one week where Blade is like, Hey guys, let's read The Art of War for our book club this week. The Art of War that Blade grills pretty hard into you as if the game actually expects you to read it before you show up at the next book club is a three paragraph journal entry sitting on a tablet in the corner of the library. My biggest problem with the game is that it has hours of optional content, but none of it stands out. There's an entirely optional explorational element to the game where you're doing things like digging up dead witches bones and talking to ghosts during the evening, but I don't even feel like talking about it to be honest. All of it's delivered in 2016 cutscene format. I did it all, and every single side quest turned out to be as surface level as it appeared from the very beginning. It's such a shame because in comparison, the combat is a triumph. Thankfully, it's very easy to skip dialogue whenever it starts to grate on your nerves, but dude, if you couldn't, that would make this game very not worth your time in my opinion. I'm happy to confirm that reaping social benefits in this game is very easy, even if you only read about 50% of what the heroes are saying to you at their almost daily vulnerable moments. But enough of all that, I think it's time I told you about my favorite part of this game. Yes, the combat is awesome, and you know what, even though the dialogue is corny, in my opinion, it's still enjoyable, especially when you can choose to turn it on and off whenever you want. But the real meat of this game, in my opinion, are the customizable book covers which you can hang around your abbey like pieces of fine art. You heard me. Every time you complete a mission, a comic book cover is created for you, usually containing the three heroes in your party, as well as any boss they fought on this mission. You're then able to customize these covers any way you see fit. Change your hero's positions, the looks on their faces, the lighting of the cover, and more. This gave me some very immature, degenerate fun. It scratches a part of my brain that makes me feel like an immature kid banging action figures together, sometimes literally. 
I got way too much fun out of this, but I know there's got to be other people out there that are as weird as me and will see this feature and think, oh man, I could make some really dumb stuff here. When I started playing this game, I did not see myself spending as much time as I did making goofy covers, but I enjoyed every second of it. I also have to give a big shout out to the cosmetics that slowly unlock over the game, especially the ones for the hunter. I had a lot of fun trying out new looks for my hero, and seeing them in the cutscenes interacting with the heroes is just so much fun. I jumped around a few ideas of what I wanted my hunter to look like, but I eventually settled on making my hunter essentially gay Deadpool. But I also liked having all my team's costumes match colors. If not that, then usually a particular color would just look perfect on a character. Like, look at Wolverine's original colors. That is fucking... Mm, God, that is, that is what I'm talking about. Yes! At the time of this recording, you can easily find Midnight Suns on sale for 20 bucks or less. For what you get, I think it's well worth the risk. Especially if any of this sounds fun to you. Growing my character's card decks up while dripping them the fuck out was way more satisfying than I ever thought it would be when I first fired up Midnight Suns. The game's pace is nearly perfect because you're the one in control of it. You want more time to build up your characters and get to know your favorite heroes? Great, do some more optional missions. You feel ready to move on in the story? That's fine too. Even though I just spent a lot of time explaining how much I hate what makes up about 50% of the game, I never felt like I was forcing myself to push through boring optional stuff. You do these parts of the game for like one to two minutes at a time, if you're just reading the text. Whenever I started to get bored, the next mission would pop up and I got excited to try out whatever I just earned. I struggle to find a game I can compare that aspect to. This game isn't here to challenge you, but it certainly can if you want it to. It's a strategy game that wants you to play it at whatever pace and difficulty you want to. So what are you waiting for? Cancel your Disney Plus account, and I need you to go suit up. We're gonna go ask Blade to finger paint with us. Thanks for watching.